Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to May. It's May 2nd. Yeah. And you can certainly record. You can also change your names. I know I started the recording already, but sometimes when I play this back, your your big fat name shows up on the screen while you're talking. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> you might want to put a picture of your cat there and change your name or something. I don't know. Whatever you like. But you can do that. So I wanted to uh so I was I was in my message, my invite to this call, I'm talking about, I want to talk about the strategies we use in an LLC. So it's not the LLC that's the magic. It's the way in which we're using it, the, our understanding of how it works. And I started using it when I saw people being annihilated in the 90s, using trust organizations and not having a clue about what they're doing, being sold a piece of paper. It's the same piece of paper that everybody else is being sold. <laughs> Excuse me. Everybody else is being sold this piece of paper, a 20-page trust document. And they gave it some fancy name. And it just, it really, it really got under my skin because that's wrong. That's not actually solving people's problems, selling them paper. <clears throat> so I started looking at what the problem was. What, what was the problem where people's property was being taken in spite of them setting up trust organizations and holding their property, their homes, and they're putting their wages in there, which is kind of silly. And I realized that it's because their property rights didn't change. They were just masking everything. The property rights were still discoverable and still the same. So what better way to do that than here's a way to do it, a partnership agreement. Okay, well, we can do that, but then you have to defend it. <clears throat> it gets complicated. But if I have something that's like a partnership agreement, this is what I concluded back in the 90s. It's like a partnership agreement, and uh, it's recognized in law and by the courts, and it's under a statute. It's created by the statute and existed. It came out of Germany in 1898. Wyoming was the first state to adopt the limited liability company statutes, and then Every other state follows suit. I think all 50 states now recognize an LLC and many modern countries around the world recognize an LLC. So um, I'm going to talk about that. So before I do that, I want to just go and mention um, the video series we have. So we have aceofcoins.club. You can still reach me on aceofcoins.com if you want to order an LLC in the consulting package. I still do that. Pretty soon, it's just going to be the video series and consulting. And now I do have a team of people that does casework they do a fantastic job. I work with them in the background. So I'm trying to get away from doing direct interaction on most cases, okay? If I'm working with you, don't worry. I'm still going to work with you. I still want to be available, but I need to parcel out my time carefully. All right. Um, but anyway, so uh, back in the 90s, I figured out, let's let's just use a limited liability company because it has all the attributes of being able to, to serve the interests of what is going to defeat a collection that's really not fair. So I can use the LLC to interact with the banking system. I can change property rights with the LLC. That's what we're doing. And so I can do it with a, a partnership agreement too. There's all kinds of ways I can do it. So here's essentially what I'm doing. I'm taking an exclusive right that I have that may be consistent with exclusive rights I have with other things. Hang on one second. Be right back. So where the liability comes with property, where a third party creditor can take your property, where the liability comes is when you have the exclusive right to spend the money or sell the property. So it's attachable. If I have a, a liability to somebody, it can be attached because the debt is mine and my ability to spend money or sell property is mine exclusively. This is what I discovered. This is where that that's the choke point. So I don't have to be the only party that has the right to sell stuff or spend money. How do I get out of that? Well, it used to be in the 70s before the software was uniform with all the banks. With, with all the banks, <clears throat> It used to be where I could just add my Uncle Bob to a bank account. And because the both of us were signing on the account, it would prevent a creditor from levying the account. It was that easy. Then when the software came in, the default settings on the software ignore that. And they create these other situations. So in order to make it work with a bank, you can't just... You can't just go into a bank and um, by default have another signer on the account. The default is this joint and several. Okay. Now I've found that even if you create change the signature card, which you can, to require two signatures, which would reach the same legal status as what I'm doing with the LLC, the bank has a tendency to ignore that. It's not something you can bank on. Ironically, I'm not trying to make a pun, but you can't rely upon that. 
But you can rely upon a legal structure that the court recognizes, a limited liability company. And the really cool thing is the court will recognize your limited liability company, even if it's expired, even if the charter is revoked, it'll recognize it forever. If the relationship is intact, okay? <clears throat> it will also recognize an LLC if there's a single member. That's kind of weird because how can it be a limited liability company if there's one person? Well, it just does, okay? It, the statutes say you can. So the court <clears throat> is going to recognize it. So what am I getting with a limited liability company? I'm getting indemnification. What does that mean? Well, it's the same kind of thing that before the LLC was really popular, before it was even available, the money interest that formed the railroad system they went to the government and said, look, we'll come in here like the Vanderbilts. We'll come in here and we'll we'll fund this railroad right of way. We'll fund it. But I don't want to risk my entire net worth. I want the government to protect me and isolating my net worth to the amount of money I'm willing to invest in this project. <clears throat> so if I have a net worth of like $100 million and I want to invest $7 million, I don't want to risk my $100 million if something goes wrong and a bunch of people die, right? Because I built it because I own this right of way or something like that. So the government said, okay, fine. If you set up a trust and fund it and then operate out of that trust, the government will indemnify you against property rights you have outside the trust. Well, that's what we're doing with the LLC. You go to the state and the state says, okay, well, for $50 or $100, you can file the charter with, with the state. And then the state will recognize the existence of the company being separate from you individually. Now, if you don't write the contract properly, and you don't use it properly, that's not recognized, but the option is still there. So it's not just we're registering a company with the state. No, we're getting indemnification. We're getting insurance for a silly filing fee, okay? We just have to use it. So it's different than a partnership. You're not gonna get that. Where you get indemnification in a partnership is in the contract itself, which is very risky. And there's a cost of litigation there. With an LLC, there's no cost of litigation or there's very limited. It's almost automatic, okay? That's why I like them. So if I take the, these ideas, right, along with the idea that if I want to take property rights and protect them, like cash, if I have property rights over spending $10,000 and I don't want a creditor that I happen to have to levy the $10,000 because it's in my name, right? I want to put it into a company. Well, if I put it into the company and I own 100% of the company, didn't protect it, it's still it's still uh, available to the creditor. But if my brother and I, who we together, we don't have the joint liability to the creditor, only I do. But he and I together own the 10,000 now because we both put it into, I put it into the company, even though maybe he didn't put any into the company. Now I've got a group of people that have an undivided interest jointly and severally in the property and there's an innocent party, right? So a creditor can't come in and take my portion unless I'm to take a portion of it out at a per a particular time in the future, right? Like a payment, like a paycheck or something like that, right? A disbursement of some kind. Then a creditor who has an active levy at that time can take it. It gives me a huge advantage to anyone else who's not doing that. That's why I like showing people this stuff. You can really, really protect things for a long period of time. You have a lot of power here. Well, I'm just using an LLC, kind of like a conduit. I can do that in Ireland. I can do it anywhere. As long as you have a property right that's that's acknowledged, that's recognized, you can do what I'm telling you here. You can do this, and an LLC is just the tool that I'm using. You know, right? I'm going to get the grass cut. I can use one mower. I can use another mower. Right? I'm going to get the grass cut. Uh, I, I just want to do it the easiest way. The LLC is kind of like the foolproof way. Uh, you can't really mess it up. There are no capitalization requirements. Um, the states recognize it. <clears throat> it's pretty easy to use. Pretty easy to amend. States are pretty quick to register them and the banks recognize them. So if I go into another uh, country, everybody has property rights. In modern countries, it's recognized you have property rights. Even though we're in a feudal system, I know I've mentioned this before, I can do the same thing in Ireland. I can take a partnership agreement and I can operate it as a partnership and I can have these same protections. Here's an example. Let's say you have an LLC, right? Look at your operating agreement. The operating agreement could be a partnership agreement. Might need to be modified a little bit, but it could be a partnership agreement. Now the operating agreement should be written in a way <clears throat> that is consistent with what you're trying to do with the ownership rights in the LLC, which most of them are. 
Okay, a lot of times the operating agreement is written for tax purposes. That's not really what they're for. It's really to manage financial risk. So, you know, the attorneys write them for the tax system. Uh, that doesn't create a tax liability, by the way. I like to write them and exclude all those and focus purely on the financial aspects, the property right aspects in that operating agreement. And so you could take my operating agreement or a version of it, and you can go and, and, and do it, uh, manage property, bank accounts, and all these things in other countries. Now it's easier if I'm working in Canada, it's easier for me to do an LLC in the States and then uh, domesticate it in Canada. Now, Canadian law doesn't recognize an LLC, but it doesn't matter because the banks will. Banks don't care. All you got to do is ask the bank what it wants. And typically it wants to register as an extra provincial company in one of your provinces. It's very simple. Same for Ireland. Uh, uh, what else? Um, European countries, put it that way. And by the way, Ireland has a uh, Republic of Ireland, I believe. I believe there's two na nations there, if I'm not, not mistaken. I know I'm, I'm wrong on this. I'm not very good at this stuff. But I think there's two nations. And one of them is very friendly to the LLC to a point where uh, an LLC organized in the Republic of Ireland, if I said that correctly, I hope I did, is recognized in pretty much every country, if there is a country still in Europe, in the European Union. <clears throat> So in any case, um, it's very useful. And the LLC is kind of like going to make it very easy to do this. But just realize you can establish property rights and use them in a certain way. Now, this leads me into the, something else, which I mentioned in the invite to this call, which has to do with the blockchain. So let's just look at the blockchain as just like you would look at comparing the United States jurisdiction. And let's say all 50 states are the same. The U.S. jurisdiction with another country like Canada or Ireland. Sure, sure, we can do this. We've already done this. I've already got clients in other countries. We've already done it well. Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, all these countries. Um, <clears throat> what about property rights that are established in the blockchain? That's coming, right? Our currency is going to be, we're going to be stuck with, uh, you know, the blockchain. Maybe it's going to be very useful. Just to understand that we can still establish property rights in the same way we do in Georgia, we can do that on the blockchain. That's coming. So I just want to mention that now, <clears throat> and we'll get to some questions, John. I'll, I'll get, I'll call you. Um, but let me just mention a couple of things. So I wanted to mention a couple of, uh, aside from this idea of property rights, it's so pervasive. It's, it has to do with everything. Okay. We can get into all the different aspects of this. <clears throat> I mean, blockchain can be used for recording property rights or accounting, a record of accounting for transactions and things like that. So let me just share with you, this is a little bit, a little bit, um, a, a couple of case examples. <clears throat> um, one was kind of funny, but I think I passed that moment. Uh, but the one I want to talk to you about is someone came to me with, uh, her accountant had uh, recommended, uh, her accounting firm had recommended regarding cryptographic currency, recommended she set up a series of trust organizations to deal with the taxes. It doesn't make any sense the way they suggested it because she ended up with like a whole series of trust organizations that required tax accounting, right? That's what accounts are recommending, ways for you to pay them for more tax accounting. And they were gonna file tax returns for all these trust organizations. And somehow that was gonna reduce or eliminate her tax liability. Probably in the end, she's gonna pay more of the same because of the thousands of dollars in accounting fees. <clears throat> and of course, the accounts get it wrong every time. Cryptos are not taxable and they shouldn't be talking about them. Just like you shouldn't be talking about commodities or airplane parts. Who cares where the money's coming from? It's cash in, cash out. Your, your liability's on the cash, unless it's accrual-based accounting, in which case you got the wrong account. For most of us, myself included. I mean, if you're running a mid-level business that's making $300 million a year, okay, fine, accrual-based accounting, that actually is actually going to help you. But for, for most of us, cash basis is what we want to be. That's when you actually have a, a gain. So anyways, we tried to explain to the accountant, they wanted to do this, she wanted to do this uh, exchange. She wanted to trade her stock that was held by herself personally, and she wanted to move it to her limited liability company so she can get a completely different you know, ownership situation going, as we all understand. And they wanted to record it as record the transaction or report it as a gift or a sale or something. And we kept asking, okay, who's the other party? Who's the counterparty? How can you gift yourself something? And then we got to a point of asking them, do you intend to make a false report to the IRS? I mean, you're an accountant. You should know better. 
you can't have one party who simply wants to change a beneficial interest, retain the beneficial interest, I should say, and just change the title of the property. You should understand what that means. So here's what I did. Just and I'm sharing this with you all so you can see how to solve problems. Now, I had never done this before, but I understand the issue. You guys are smart. You understand some of this stuff. Here's what I did. I went to the AI application, chat GPT, open AI. And I said, hey, to the AI, <laughs> I started a conversation. I said, hey, can you help me with a putting together an accounting memorandum? Because this is how accounts communicate with each other, right? With, there's an accounting policy that needs to be adopted or recognized that they write up a memorandum and they pass it around. Now, I know that much. I just didn't know what one looks like. And I'm not an accountant. I don't know anything about accounting. So I asked the AI, can you write me up a memorandum for accounting, an accounting memorandum for accountants? And I need to establish that there's no tax liability when the beneficial interests remain the same when I simply change the ownership in some property, not in real estate, but like in this case, it was cryptographic. No, it was, uh, it was stock. It was stock ownership. So in one second, the AI wrote me this memorandum, this beautiful memorandum with all the components of what, this is how accounts talk to each other. The only thing it didn't have in there was the um, statutory citation in Title 26, which I'm familiar with, so I went and got it. So I got this citation that deals with, there's no tax consequence when the exchange results in the beneficial interest not changing. It actually says in there, there's no tax consequence. In the, in the Title 26, it was like 2027 or something. Don't look it up, guys. It, it, it's, it's something. It's one of the lower numbers, like 3,000 or 2,000 section. Anyways, so I wrote this one-pager memorandum. The AI wrote most of it. I put in a legal citation, gave it to the client, gave it to the accountants. Then that got them to do the right thing. And um, they handled the transaction. So that's one example. Okay. So I, I do this professionally, but I'm just saying you guys can also use AI. You got to think this stuff through though. How do I communicate with an accountant when I don't have the standing? I don't have the professional standing. Well, the, the answer is don't. <laughs> don't. Have your client do it through an accounting memorandum. So what happens is you preserve the accountant's professional standing by giving him an accounting memorandum and that which he can pass around. And that way he it doesn't look like his client's advising him or remediating him on accounting practices, right? You preserve his ego. I mean, really, a lot of this stuff is about communicating effectively. This is what I'm this is what I'm telling you the story. Now, the second one. And maybe I'll tell you the funny one afterwards about me. But the second one uh, had to do with this woman. She she uh, well she paid a lot of money, ten thousand dollars for what I was starting as earlier uh, for setting up trust organizations. So, anyways, we had we had prepared a letter and um, we got her money back because we said, look, this is wrong. Uh, you're making the wrong conclusion. Here's why. Gave him a little legal memorandum, helped remediate them, remediate them a little bit. And after a little bit of hesitant, hesitancy, the, the accounting firm agreed to give her the money back. So, you know, sometimes you got these things going on and um, you can't, you can communicate with people. Now, as a matter of communication, I was, the, the funny thing is, when I, when I started this call, I was saying that it's not me. It's just an AI representation. <clears throat> you know, I had, I had the bar contact my office uh, years ago. The last communication I ever had with the bar, the bar is always trying to like mess with me, right? So the bar sends a letter to my office saying, hey, um, what are you doing over there? We think you're practicing law. We don't know that you're a bar member. And it was addressed to me. But I set up the mail in such a way that it didn't look like oh, they, they had the right office. So anyways, it's a long story. But what I did was I wrote a letter back and I said, this guy doesn't work for us. Us. This guy doesn't work for us. We just have a license to use his likeness. So as far as your other questions, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and that was the end of it. So, you know, it's kind of a funny way to deal with something that could have been a big controversy because if you play the game, well, then they're going to eat you alive. So you have to come up with a way to communicate effectively. That's, that's my point there, I think. Anyways, yeah. So guys, look, AI, okay. <laughs> One last thing on the AI. Um, so today I went to go uh, just... My wife usually tutors my my children and I give them the lessons and then she works with them. So I went back to check on them because you have to, <laughs> you have to follow up, right? The 15 year old and the 12 year old. And so I'm having my 15 year old learn some basic chemistry, nothing complicated. 
anyways, definitions and stuff like that. Well, she's acting like she can't understand it. So there was a question that she had to answer. And I said, I said to her, okay, there's the question, but we're not going to answer that question. She's like, what? I said, well, first of all, you need to tell me what this, there was a term in the question. I'm not going to get into it, but there was a chemistry term in the question. And I said, you need to know what that, what does that mean? And she couldn't answer me. I said, well, let's start there. So I showed my wife, I went to the AI, I queued it up on her computer and I said, hey, to the AI, hey, um, could you help me answer or come up with an explanation regarding a basic intro level chemistry question? And the AI said, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> so it took me three questions to dial it in. And basically what I said was, can you help me define this term? And then how does that relate to the such and such? And, what? and it came up with like, a page or a page and a half of what really came out to a lesson. And I printed that out, that discussion with the AI, and I gave it to my daughter and she got it. She was able to answer the question and understand the term. So this is a really useful tool. And I know the AI interaction is being collected. That data is being collected. It's behavioral data. It's being analyzed. It's being absorbed into the AI network. It's being used to understand people, but you're not gonna avoid it guys. Use it for your benefit. Yeah, I know many of you are using AI already. A lot of you are, I mean, you'll admit that uh, you don't need to hire anybody anymore for your business because you, you got the AI there. So, I mean, why not? I used to hire people in India. I can get a lot more really competent people for less money and be effective. So so uh, I, I, let me go with questions here. I know John had uh, asked me something, but uh, did you give up? Did I miss you? No, I, I just took the hand down i have headphones on i didn't know is, is the audio okay yeah i can hear you just fine yeah okay good um i was going to uh say if you wanted to uh tell them about my example with the the llc and the trust and um i can kind of give you the quick recap and then you can add all you want to it but yeah remind me please yes yeah, basically we had a farm and um a house that was uh, on a separate deed, it was an acre of the house and 130 acres on the farm. And uh, we did a, uh, um, I pulled my IRA money out early uh, to do investing in cryptos and whatnot. And um, then the tax liability came in 2022 and we didn't have it obviously yet because of the downturn. So, um, but when I sold the, when I pulled the money out, I also, um, did a quick claim deed on the property. It was in me and my wife's name and we formed a, a, a trust and, um, just named, uh, we did a quick claim deed. I did it by myself at the courthouse, put our, our name is quick claiming it to the trust. And then I did a declaration of trust at the recorder's office, um, and said that the trust was, uh, uh, the trustee was an LLC that I created, uh, in the state of Ohio. Yeah. And we ended up, uh, I did filing fee, 99 bucks to get the trust or the LLC registered with the state. And I have the secretary of state's letter in good standing. And all it is is a piece of paper that says article of org organization on file. And if I'm correct, um, we don't have any uh, record or any uh, print of the LLC's operation yet because we don't need it yet. If we ever need it, that's when we create it. Oh, um, yeah, right. You like, can do that. Sure. Because we don't have any members listed, we don't have anything on the declaration of trust. All it says was that this trust is is uh, formed and in full force and full effect as of this date. And the trustee is this LLC that we named. And um, I, I think the beneficiary. I don't even know if we named a beneficiary in the declaration, but if we did, it would have been our our children or something like that. So if you go to the tax records and uh, look up our uh, our taxes, it basically says um it's it's in a trust name on the tax records but if they did go and look at where the uh taxes get mailed to it has the address but it also says that the um contact information is the llc so well, does that that keeps us separate from all the irs uh stuff that we're there's all starting kinds to of ways with to do now. it so what you did is you you remove the ownership from your estate you right yeah and a lot of times i'll do that if somebody's using a trust i don't like to criticize the trust i mean maybe it's written written well i don't i don't know but what i will ask is if i want to see who the uh, beneficiaries are and the trustee so that way i want to make sure there's a separation if there's not a separation i'll replace the trustee with an llc yeah, yeah. and many times it's not registered 
Well, we have the, yeah, the trust we haven't created yet either. We just named the trust and we just named the LLC. So I have no documentation anywhere yet that's, that's been formed. The only thing that's been yeah. recorded is the declaration of trust. Um, and then I, if, if we did name the beneficiaries, it would have been the kids. So it wouldn't be in our name. Um, and that's who the IRS would be coming after, would be sure. me and my wife on that part. My only question was, it was, like I told you before a long time ago, was it's sort of like having a double-barreled shotgun if we did an easement on there too now, because then that would help even create more distance if the trust could grant easements to whoever or whatever oh, it decides. The title holder can grant easements, sir. Right. And so the trust is the title holder, but the LLC is the trustee and owns. The, and then would you say that the LLC owns the trust or is just a trustee and another LLC should own the trust? How, how would that work? I don't know that I'd like to say there's an owner of the trust. OK, it's trust just is a, a relationship. Trust. It can it is a trust is a relationship, but it can also be recognized as an entity. If it's issuing trust certificates, then sure, I guess you could have an owner. But I don't I don't use them that way. You can. I like using a limited liability company. I like it real simple. LLC and then ownership. Okay. Well, the we already had the trust it, form. Yeah. Like we'd already did the quick claim deed um, and put it in a trust. But that's when you said that they'll, they'll blow through that because they'll just say that, you know, we just did that to hide. So then we ended up doing a declaration of trust and naming. Yeah, the declaration the will help in that case. So we, sometimes you don't need that. But Okay. We, we just did that to show that the LLC was involved with the trust and it wasn't just that, me this, doing, the doing a work. Pack. Yeah. Once you throw the LLC in there, it's kind of bulletproof. What are they going to okay. do? Now, would the easement still be a, a good thing to do in case of the, like, like, like you said, it's just separating the property rights out of the title rights anyhow. So would an easement, yeah. like I said, just give us a double barrel shotgun? It's just another way to preserve your property rights. Yes. That's how we're using okay. it. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd share so that way if anybody ever had problems, they could see how we did it and, and yeah. you could say That's if it was good, ba good, bad, or not. Yeah, thanks, John. All right, and Clay, what do you want to ask? Clay? Hey, can you hear me, Johnny? It's fine, yep. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny. I can't get that hand signal thing. But anyway, no problem. You're on. All right. Well, I had a question today. I went to the uh, tax office, right? And... Um, to secure my um, property, my um, transfer deed. I'm going to transfer my property into my own property. <laughs> oh, that 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 sounds pretty stupid. But um, I'm re they're trying to charge me two two thousand five hundred dollars to make the transfer. Okay. I'm sorry, but anyway, what I'm trying to do, and that might be fine. That okay. might be fine. But what I'm trying to say is that I, I'm making a um, uh, I, Hey, Johnny, I'm sorry. I was in the military and I got hit by a bomb and my brain doesn't work so good. I hear you. No problem. So I, 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 I really apologize. It's okay. But, uh, if you're if you're conveying property, uh, it sounds like if you're paying a few thousand dollars to convey property, maybe you're being assessed a tax, and there there should be an exempt option uh, if you're retaining beneficial interest. If you're just changing the titling of it, you shouldn't be paying that much money. Maybe there's a recording fee. Maybe it's like twenty bucks. Well, so yes, yeah, where that. Um, what state what is I it? What I did in? was I I followed your directions on may, making a. Uh, transfer in my account and what i did was i did made that transfer and um um is a trans uh i'm sorry sir i can't explain it right now it might I, help I, if you want to if you want to send it in writing or put it on the chat here yeah I'll i can do restate that. it i'll do that, that for you sir yeah yeah no problem but yeah, conveying property for a few thousand dollars sounds to me like there's some tax going on beyond the filing fee. So well, just they're check. saying it is a. Uh, uh, my vision's really bad, but um, they're saying they're charging me nine thousand nine hundred dollars for um, additional taxes 
But you know what? I'm not going to take up your time. I will leave a chat with you. And, that, and thank you. Yeah, send me a chat. I'd like to yeah, hear. I, I don't want to do that. Okay. That's all right. Thank you. No problem. All right, Karen, what do you want to ask? Hi, John. Um, hey. I got the LLC set up that we talked about, and okay. um, I set it up as a single member. And uh, really, it, I guess my 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 question is, is I, I want to make sure I don't have anything to do with the CTA. Is that on hold? The FinCEN stuff, the Corporate Transparency Act? Or do I still need to file something? You mean the, reporting the beneficial owner information? Yeah. <laughs> they already got defeated. Okay. I just wanted they, to make sure. They didn't make it two months. And because I, there's other conflicting information on the internet. I know what you Top of the internet thinking. and conflicting information. These are idiots. You yeah. got to read the actual law. Yeah. Okay. Go read it. I've got many videos on there. I cite the statute. I cite the regulation. I explain why, assuming that the the rule they were promoting, assuming it created a legal duty, assuming, well, okay, I was assuming that it was constitutional. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to argue that it was not constitutional. I know it's not. I'm just assuming that it was because it survived public debate. So I'm thinking, what the heck? It's probably constitutional. Let's not even go there, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I showed everyone how it did not create a legal duty because in order to qualify for an exemption, you first have to comply. A law doesn't do that. Also, if there was a legal duty to report beneficial owner information, it would conflict with Title 26 USC 6103, which prevents you from having to disclose that information. Okay. So laws can't conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. But some attorney beat them in Georgia. So yeah, that was yeah, the end of that. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. So um, don't don't. Uh, there's nothing new. There's no new duty. You can you can create your LLC and move on. Don't you don't report okay. to the federal government. It's ridiculous. So I'm just going to get the bank accounts opened under my name, and then I'm going to contact you or your assistant to because we want to change it to the multi member. Yeah, sure. Let us know. We can revise it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Sure, Karen. Thanks. Alrighty. And uh, Jacob. Hey, Jay. Hey. Hey, I'm curious, man. Like when I'm um um I you know I sent you that interesting um 1099DA but I'm um, I'm curious when I'm dealing with um C and B um Caleb and Brown do I need to like understand what their um reporting requirements are to um to the banks here back in the you United always States ask. when you're dealing with organizations ask. from the United States always ask if they're under a tax treaty for reporting okay do you do, do you know I, about I have to know, as of today, as far as I know, that Australia and Caleb or Brown are not under any reporting. Now, Australia might be, but Caleb or Brown is not a financial institution that would be under that treaty if there is such a treaty. I think there is a treaty, but yeah. Caleb or Brown is not under that. So it doesn't Got do it. 1099, it doesn't do FinCEN reporting, but you need to ask anyways. It should be okay. part of your just due diligence for what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And if I was going to ask you, you know, if for whatever reason they are, is, is, do I need to treat whatever reports they generate and send out to me? Do I need to re treat those any differently or no. don't do anything it's, differently? Just yeah. Cause it's, to, it's right now. yeah. Nothing changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I have a, um, I have an LLC and a trust with them. Um, I feel like the LLC is a lot more straightforward and the <laughs> trust. Um, is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, and I'm just kind of curious if, uh, like if that trust, if it matters, if it's irrevocable or if it's a revocable trust, if that really determines how I'm managing, you know, potential risk. Okay. Well, I can just say from what I do, I look at financial risk and I think you have financial risk, the kind of risk you want to avoid, which is having some lawyer or, uh, a, a government agency or a court, a judge, order the property to be removed from the trust if it's revoked. Yeah. So if the trustee, if, let's say yourself, let's, let's say you're the trustee of yeah. a, if you, you're the trustee of a revocable trust and you yeah. have property that you're trying to protect, yeah. there is a chance that you could be ordered to uh, remove the trust, remove the trust property. 
Right, because I still I have access it. to it. Otherwise, yeah. if it was irrevocable, I, I wouldn't be able to do that because I don't have control More over than it. likely if it's written correctly, yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, is it written correctly? And you don't know. It's a, it's a wild card because some lawyer can just have all kinds of attacks on it. And it will cost you a lot of money. You to know? litigate it. Yeah, lawyers can um, subpoena the trust documents. And if you don't know how to defend it, that's the problem. People think the trust in itself is the end, and it's not. You have to defend it. With an LLC, it's already defended by the statutes. Right, right. That's why I, like. I like to have the trust as the owner of the LLC sometimes. But uh, that's why I like in the LLC because my first risk for the client to avoid is cost of litigation. You guys come to me and ask about IRS. I'm thinking cost of litigation. Whatever I yeah. set up for you, my thinking is cost of litigation. I don't care about the IRS. You guys yeah. do. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so it sounds like it would actually be smarter to go ahead and um, – uh, create an LLC and create a, an account for that. Yeah, if you, use, that. yeah use the LLC. It's, it's very useful. The LLC. Yeah. Well, I already have one. I just need to create another one. Okay. Uh, yeah. John, can I ask Jacob a quick, a, a quick question? Jacob? Oh, sure. Uh, yep. So you were able to set up your um, LLC with Caleb and Brown without any problems? Uh, yeah, I, I did it a little while ago. Um, but yeah, I recently I, I attempted to set up um, another trust account with them and they wanted me they, they wanted me to send them the actual entire trust document. And yeah, that's what I, they did to me. That yeah. didn't seem right to me. Yeah, you but should I don't never know. do that. Yeah, I, I well, yeah. And it didn't I seem didn't right to it. me. So I didn't, do so it. I didn't send it. Um, I all just they get is the them, declaration of trust, which is a summary of the trustee and all that. Well, um, basically, their compliance office said, "Hey, our requirements have changed, and we need the whole trust." <clears throat> okay, so do you guys know what my responses on that? Can I tell you if you don't? Maybe for yes, this call, please. Yeah, Let okay, it rip. so you can't just you should not just say no. Yeah, you're just not going to deal with the world that way. So what you have to do is say, "Okay, fine, I can disclose it to you." However, the disclosure is subject to terms of non-disclosure. And liquidated damages in the amount of, you can say in the amount of whatever you want, $250,000. You can also say substantial Amen. liquidated damages. The only way I can disclose this to you is if you indemnify me for that penalty under the contract. So that's like asking them to write you a blank check because you didn't tell them how much it is, right? And when yeah. you do tell them, they're like, hell no, I'm not going to agree to that. Mm -hmm. Because disclosing it to you is a data breach. So I'm sorry, it's out of my control, but I've given you enough to make your own determination. And what are you trying to determine anyways? I gave you all my, you have more information than my grandmother. Yeah, I'll put that in a letter to them. You can, one little paragraph, yeah. I've done that. Okay, yeah, well, that'll, be, that'll, them, be, but, yeah. that'll be fun to like write that out and send yeah. that out and see, see what the response is. Because like I said, I did that with Kraken around the PMA and they said, well, send me, you know, send us a list of all the members. And I said, well, I already I'm did. Not able to... <laughs> well, no, I said, <laughs> I, said I, wasn't able, I, I said I wasn't able to do that. And they said, well, we just need the form. You can black out everyone's name. So, I sent, a, so I sent them a form because they <laughs> just need, they just need the form. So, cause they're required to have a piece of paper. Yeah. So if they get that piece of paper, then they've gone through the steps that they're required to go through. It doesn't matter what's on that piece. Well, of a paper. response could be something like, please send me your intake form and I'll be glad to fill it out with some redactions. And that would yeah, be. And so yeah. I sent them a form. I redacted all the information. What an insane and, world. And wow. I, I put my name on there and it works. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the woman who was asking me the question, try that. Okay. That's very good to know. Yeah, try that, Elaine. Just uh, redact a bunch of stuff, or do the uh, I do that thing that um John said. Write them, write them yeah. that um. The yeah, just NDA. say yeah, okay, but uh, it's subject to substantial liquidated damages for non-disclosure, and that's part of the deal. Um, I yeah. let me I give a quick example before I go to Jake. Uh, not Jacob, but you're done, right, Jacob? Thank you for answering yeah. her, brother. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, in my office, uh, when they deliver the mail, the mail is delivered by contract, right? When you pay the postage. The carrier gets it and delivers it. That's part of the deal. And I benefit from that, even though the sender paid the postage, right? So I go to get the mail, but they put it in a locked room. And so you have to have a contract with this Luxor One. 
to get access and you have to use your phone and they email you and say, you have a package, use this QR code and bullshit like that. You know, I don't use my phone for that stuff. I use my phone. I barely use it for texting. So they were emailing me because they assume I was going to be an account holder. And I, when, it, when they discovered I didn't want a contract with them because I already had a contract. I don't need to enter into a new contract to get my damn mail. So I went and read the terms and the terms are that they are used video surveillance and collect my, they use this term likeness and that I waive all claims to the use storage and collection of my likeness. Wow. Can you believe this? Wow. So this is a violation of the postal regulations that obstruct my access to the mails, including UPS and USPS and DHL. You're obstructing my access to the mail. You can't do that. It's actually a crime. Now I found a solution because I hate to, you know, I, I could take on 47 battles a week. So I just, I, all I do is I go down there, chill out, wait a few minutes. Somebody walks in there to get his mail. I just walk in after him and get my mail. And I'm moving <laughs> anyway. So, but still the point is you see this stuff happening all around us and people don't give it a second thought. I bet nobody's read the, read that. But for me, my likeness is important. And what if I'm a, a famous actor or something and I'm under contract and someone else has the licensing rights on my likeness. That's how actors operate. That's their bread and butter. And then someone is, t I'm supposed to then be able to waive my rights. I can't because I already have a contract over here that precludes me to, from doing it. You see, so <clears throat> my point there is that don't assume, these companies assume that I could just waive my rights all anytime I want until I form them that I already have a contract with somebody else and you're intruding upon that contract unreasonably. This is a nice way to, to get around and deal with the outside world because now what are they going to do? It's like that example uh, that when my wife and I were first married and we we're looking for furniture for the house and we had this arrangement. If anything's over $1,000, we have to agree on it. That was just our you know, marriage. That's how we want to do things. But we also used it. So when we go furniture, furniture shopping, we walk in and split up. So that way the salesperson, they don't know what to do. You know how they get you at the door? So the salesperson would have to choose or there'd be two salespeople. Yeah, yeah. And then invariably they would offer something. Hey, you want this? And they'd find out what, we're, what we want. And I'd say, well, that sounds great and all, but I can't really make a decision until I talk with my wife. And that's what you're doing now. You're negotiating with someone who's not in the room. That's what I'm showing you how to do so that you don't just say no. It's an intelligent response that's rational. It's reasonable. And they have to have a better game if they want to keep up with you. That's what you're doing by saying, I have a non-compete agreement or a non-disclosure agreement with liquidated damages, substantial liquidated damages. All right, Jacob, do you have any more? I'm gonna, okay. Uh, where, where are you gonna post this, John? Cause I, re I really need to listen to what you said again and, uh, and the other gentleman, John. Yeah, I will, um, like last week, I will render this uh, immediately and I'll put it up. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put the link on the Ace of Coins channel on Telegram, okay? Okay. I don't Thank think I'll make it public. I might make it public. I don't know yet. I might have to edit it a little bit. Okay. I I just want to make sure I get what you had to say. Sure. And the other gentleman, correct? Mm, yep. Okay. All right. And uh, I'll go to Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth, thanks for your patience. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> on, hi. Yeah. Um, so this is on a different note. Um, I have, uh, I started a business and I, opened it in my uh, my LLC name and I already have my bank account. And um, so now I'm making some bank and I, I wanna put the funds in there, which I, I'm doing. So my question is um, spending from that account. So like for my living expenses and stuff like that, is there anything I need to know or you can advise? Yeah, if you on spend the money out of there, but before you spend the money there, it's just sitting there as unsettled funds if you wanna treat it that way. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be taxed, even if your company gets a 1099. If you spend it for personal expenses, you just consider that as part of your gross income, all right? And that should be reported as other or miscellaneous income on your 1040. Okay. Okay. It is it is only discoverable at an audit, but I just, just recommend doing the right thing. Why, why not report it? I mean, how are you going to, if you're living off of it, and your living expenses for your demographic are sixty thousand a year, and you're reporting thirty. It's going to cause an audit. So, just report your living expenses. Now that that means like this. So let's say your living expenses are you need to have sixty thousand, right? You don't need one hundred twenty thousand. You don't need to own three boats, 
right? So the more things you own, the more expenses you have to have to justify your 1040. So you can reduce the expenses down to a reasonable amount and then keep your 1040 minimal. And if you're going to use the business money for something like a new car, you can buy that new car if you do it for the business, if it's the business's car or if it's another business's car, just title it that way or title it with a loan where the business is the lender or something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So then just keep, I just keep track of the expenses I use out of that account for my living. Like I you pay can. my rent. Yep. I do. So I know how to, I would report yeah. it or what. You could pay it right out of the company. It, unless you have a partner that cares, uh, pay it right out of the company, just report it as 1040 income. Keep a record of it. Yeah. Living expenses. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Cause I'm considered the CEO of my business. So okay. just, it, you know, it's not filing returns, is it? No, no. Okay. That, then you can do it that way. Yeah. Just use your 1040. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks. All right. Sure thing. All right. Clay, did you want to ask something else? Sir. Oh, no, yeah, okay. I was just wondering uh, if you could give a little clarity on like, what are the, we use these these terms like LLC and trust, and I've got like a private limited thing in Singapore and whatever. And I'm wondering if you could just describe like, what are the actual like distinguishing characteristics that that you're thinking about like one entity versus the other? Like you said, a trust is a relationship and an LLC is statutory, okay. but like, what is the actual yeah. like property of an LLC that you're like looking for and making it like, whatever all right so a trust typically is going to be what? where property is conveyed the ownership of the property is conveyed from one party to another for the benefit of beneficiaries it's that simple okay and and is are these llc statutes worth reading or do we not have to really worry about getting into that much detail with these things i shoot i don't know i mean you know you can read, there's a whole section, in, there's a whole chapter of statutes that govern LLCs in your state. Why not read them? Right. I mean, why? You okay. Know, I, I mean, I yeah, probably yeah. did that if I remember. I probably did that in the beginning because I was searching for a thing I could use. And uh, reading the statutes to help me understand. Um, sometimes if you don't get carried away, I hate to recommend this, but if you don't get carried away in the commentary, you will find some really good commentary from lawyers uh, on these structures and many times they will cite legal references. In fact, you might find some scholastic papers on these subjects on the internet, just random searches on the internet. Um, I caution you though, because I know a lot of you like to read everything on the internet and then freak out over commentary and you don't consider the source. So just consider the source on that. It's very boring reading by the way. <laughs> well, that's subjective. Um, True, yeah. Uh, yeah, just one other thing on that. You mentioned that, um, uh you the lc would still be uh uh recognizable i think you were said even if the it was expired so okay, yeah, so the relationship is company, intact so i was just wondering what does that mean the relationship is intact right, a limited that. liability company is where property is conveyed to fund the company and it's it's basically a partnership okay uh, a limited liability uh, company the best way to describe it is a uh, statutory partnership or a corporate partnership it's a partnership. That is the best way to describe it. That is not a trust. I don't know if that helps you, but that's the same in every- It's a starting point. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, I'm trying to keep it really simple because it's, it's such a generic, this is the very basic understanding of an LLC, okay? And the very basic understanding of a trust. It gets way complex but it's not necessary. And there's all, only two types of trust, guys. Yeah, I hear you guys ta all talking about this type of magical Massachusetts business trust, unincorporated business trust organization, all these things, okay? It's either going to be revocable, the property is conveyed irrevocably, or revocably. That's it. There's two types of trust. And then we go on from there. Now, the, the trust itself govern the property that's conveyed to the trust, and I would say that the trust corpus, the body of the trust, is the law of the property that the trust owns. So if John Smith has property and he conveys it in trust for the benefit of beneficiaries and becomes the trustee, John Smith no longer owns the property. John Smith as trustee owns the property for the benefit of beneficiaries. That's how that works. Okay.
Okay. Well, whatever. Okay, Elaine. I, I would disregard all that stuff. But anyways, uh, so go to Kat. Kat, what did you want to ask? Hi, John Jay. Um, you know what? You uh, mentioned just once briefly infinite banking concept, and then I did some research. So now you're going to help me uh, create the LLC. And I'm wondering, connecting to the previous lady's question, the income from LLC, is it possible to have a part, is part of compensation or salary to yourself for LLC to be paying your whole life insurance premiums? And then eventually you can get the money out of that whole life insurance as, as your as your living expenses. Yeah, uh, if you own the policy, then it's a personal expense. And so it's income. Just know that it's income. But you don't have to own the policy. Your LLC can own the policy. Why wouldn't you just do that? Oh, I didn't realize that. The LLC can own the policy. It doesn't have to be like a, a, a sure. person that there's they an insured, check health and stuff. Yeah, there's an insured and there's a policy owner. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, I like the guy like in New York who actually income. told me that corporations that you work for often have policies on their employees and people aren't necessarily yeah. aware of that. Yeah. And look, so that just, could be part yeah. of the income. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, you, sure. You could, yeah, exactly. If the LLC owns the policy, which I recommend, and you're going to use that money and do stuff and get other returns on it, and it's going right back to the LLC. That's perfect. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And guys, as much as I just make a comment here, because of what Elaine's post was, as much as I like Jay, I respect him, Jay Sterling, I would disregard all this nonsense on the 1099 DA, because this comes from an attorney. And attorneys like to scare people. Apparently, they scared Jay, whoever this was. And it's just nonsense. Stop. 1099 DA, stop. It's nothing. All right, Alex. Thank you for that, John. All right. I, I I I figured that was the case. I think you did talk about that once uh, um, a little while ago. Yes, I did. I had a video last year on the 1099 DA. And at that time, there was nothing on it. It was just someone was some news out there to try to see what people would do. Now that apparently there's probably some discussion in the um, federal register. So if you all want to check it out, I searched on it. I did a video. I showed you how to search for it. Go look for the 1099 DA form. It would have be um, it would be approved by the Office of Management and Budget. It'll have a an OMB number on it. It'll okay. be forty five something probably. Okay. It'll be forty five. The OMB number for that type of document is probably going to start with fifteen forty five. Okay. Okay. Hey John, how you doing? Yes, all right, good. I I I knew you were going to get some uh, questions about Crypto J's latest post because yeah. uh, that seems to happen a lot where. It shows up here. What do you think? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you had mentioned uh, about how some attorneys do have some in, some useful information on the internet and stuff. And I did see something just recently about, there was an attorney talking about the differences between member managed and manager managed LLCs. Yeah. And maybe you could talk about that. Is there some way to use them? He was talking about a way to set up a manager managed LLC as the, uh, I guess, the umbrella to a member managed LLC or is do what maybe I have that backwards but no, should, I don't maybe even, you can explain the I difference. I don't like the non-member managed because you create all this disclosure situation where the bank says oh, okay let's see your contract with this car company and then you know it's mm. just most of my clients are by themselves so what good is that uh, but just the same if I'm working with a group of people and you guys want like a four or five member LLC I think that's ideal if you can arrange that a four or five member LLC would avoid the uh, excuse to collect your beneficial owner information at the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Because you'd be under the 20% threshold or the 25% threshold, right? Oh, okay. If you had five members. Right. Interesting. Okay. So can, can you just add four or five members to your LLC to accomplish Sure can. That? Just amend the articles, yep. Okay. Just know that if you add, the, if you add them, they might at some point have to disclose their IDs, even if they're not signers on the account, which is probably not fair, but the bank may ask for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And so, John, so you'll have to be adults or living? Yeah, you should have people that are competent. And yes, they're alive. Yes. And no fake names. Yeah. People with IDs that can, they're willing to give them up. <laughs> In that case, I'm not going to use fake names. You know, it's not necessary. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, because by by grouping together, you're gonna all avoid the liability. So it's it's kind of nice. It's okay to do that. Uh, and let me go to John. Did you did I even skip you? I thought we. Um, you okay? No, I just had a, I had a quick follow up oh. with that Caleb and Bra that Caleb and okay. Brown thing. All right. Um, all you need to like the trust to own is the bank account itself. So is it that big of a deal to give them the trust information to open the account? Because that trust shouldn't hold anything but that bank account that you're dealing with. That's okay. It's so liquid. Yeah, that's a good point. The thing I is, mean, it's no, I'm not going to have nothing. I already have a trust formed with but them. The, the, but the I thing didn't is, if, we, if we just give it to them without opposition, then they're, they're going to think it's okay. And then if you don't do it, they're just not going to open the account for you. But if most people don't do it, they're going to have to change your policy. Right. Yeah, it's, I totally agree with that. Else. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would fight them a little bit, but if you still need them to participate. Give them a memorandum that... or give them a fake trust and say this is subject to change without notice. Right. That's the other thing I was going to ask sure. you. Was, could you? But the only thing I'm using that trust for, because they have to have the trust name so and the bank account has to match and blah, blah, blah. But that's the only thing that's in Declaration that trust. Declaration of trust. So, yeah so really there's that's nothing for. in the trust but, but the bank why, account why do you think attorneys came up with that <laughs> they don't want to disclose this stuff either right but they write all the right. regs and want us to disclose it <laughs> right so i that's all i thought i just thought it's really not it's a non-issue if you don't use the and you shouldn't use that anything else except for that yeah uh, guys i'm gonna i'm gonna trade. take one more question that i gotta run i've got a call with uh, michelle melendez um blossom inner wellness in hawaii on her channel, if you want to join that, it's going to be, oh, I think she's yeah. a live broadcast, I think. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to, um, I think, I, I think it's going to be a, a link like this, but anyways, let me go to Lyle. Lyle, did you want to ask me something? I'm sorry to cut you all short, but I, I have this eight o'clock. Lyle, what do you think? All right. Hey. Yeah. Just one, wanted to ask a sort of following up on the question about the whole life insurance. Is there a list you've made or is there a video you've made with like a list of all these kind of different uh, creative solutions for how to best spend money from it. How to use that, uh, the insurance money? No, not, not, not insurance, but generally like ways to effectively spend money so that, so that it doesn't have to be. Uh, okay. Well, I don't have a list per se, but my strategy of managing the use of cash is designed to, cover many different uses of many types of uses. So if you come to me and say, I, I want to do it for stock, if I set it up that way, it'll also work for cryptos by the way it's set up. So it, it handles big swaths of use, even though you come to me for one thing. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe we can have a more of a discussion on like actual cases I've worked over the years. I've done tens of thousands of them and there's like probably 15 categories. I don't know if that answers you. I hope it does. Well, so even even a, even a list of the principles of those fifteen categories would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I try to discuss it. That's why this call. I mean, if you go to the beginning of this call, I was discussing those exact principles. They're you. They're the same in every situation. Divesting exclusive property rights. How to respond to a request for your operating agreement or your trust document. Right. You have another obligation with substantial penalties that handles a huge swath of cases. All right. So I've got to go to the interview right now, guys. Is, thanks so much. Is, is her, uh, is that, on, is that going to be a zoom call or on her yes, YouTube channel? Yeah. Go to her channel. It's probably a live broadcast. I've got to go. It's not Okay. It's not Thank there. You. Thank you, All John. Right.